Okay, now, this is an important milestone in my history because I was a, an expert witness in the 2003 uh, case. The University uh, of Michigan was uh, accused of racial discrimination by whites because they had, we had, a, we had and, and I do say had, an affirmative action program. Um, this was one of the greatest days of my life in 2003 when I woke up and found that the Supreme Court had ruled in our favor, in favor of the university, which made it possible for universities all over the country to have affirmative action. Unfortunately, the voters in Michigan have um, overturned that. Um, so Michigan itself, is, the state, is not able to, to benefit from this, but, but many other universities, including the university where I am now, the University of Chicago, are able to do this. And the court felt that the state had, had ruled that the state had a compelling interest in having a diverse student body and that uh, the, uh, the, the program at the University of Michigan was, was narrowly tailored to achieve that goal and therefore it was legal. However, um, Sandra Day O'Connor, who wrote the, the uh, majority opinion, said that in 25 years, we expect that affirmative action will not be necessary because the, the schooling system the, the developmental sort of education that kids get up until they're in 12th grade, whether it come from home or school, would be so well equalized that there would be plenty of minority applicants who could get into the University of Michigan and other selective schools without the benefit of affirmative action. So there's kind of assumption that progress is going to happen. Now, she said that in 2003. And yet we know that the gap stopped closing around 1990, and now we're 2009, six years into it, so, in a sense, the court's saying, we've got a deadline on this. The deadline's down to 19 years. Well, we don't want to wait that long, but we might not get there at the rate we're going. What are we going to do about it? Um, but why did the progress stop? And can school, ref can school improvement get us back on track? Well, there's a lot of explanations put forward about why progress stopped. Uh, labor market discrimination is one. Uh, in Neil's paper, he refutes that. He doesn't deny the existence of labor market discrimination, but what is very clear is that the benefit of getting a high school degree or a college degree for a minority person is dramatic, especially for men, and even, in fact, larger than it is for whites. What I mean is that the difference between how well you'll do if you have a degree versus not is greater. And this actually makes sense if you think about it. If there is discrimination out there, you need the credential to get the job. And that's basically what the results show. And if that's true, then there ought to be plenty of motivation for people to pursue education. Why is this happening? Why are we seeing this, this gap uh, not, not being closed anymore? Um, another argument is, you know, well, we've come up against basic differences in intelligence. And I think the evidence is clear. You know, I mean, it's, it's not something that a lot of people in this room ever believed. It's nothing that I ever believed, but it's been asserted, you know, uh, Hernstein and Murray and others. Um, we're getting more empirical evidence that we can refute this. Um, the work of James Flynn, for example, shows that uh, the gap in IQ scores is, has been closing at a rapid rate, which, um, <clears throat> which can't happen if these things have a genetic basis because it takes thousands of years for the genes to change. So these gaps are closing rapidly. When we look at, um, when we look at black kids who are raised in, in uh, white families, they look like the other white kids in the family much more than, than their gaps are small. And what this begins to reveal, of course, is something that a lot of us knew, and I'm sure Sam, uh, I assume, would agree, that. The IQ test is, is, a, is a cultural marker, uh, and, and it's not really a measure of intelligence, but it's, this, is, this is nevertheless an argument that it's good that we can refute. What about the social environment? And I think that's where we see the, the most powerful explanation for why the gap stopped. More than schools. Certainly schools could do a lot better. But in terms of understanding why did this gap stop, I think the, the most <clears throat> powerful explanation still comes from the work of William Julius Wilson in the late 80s. In his book, book, The Truly Disadvantaged, he traces the collapse of industry in the inner city. Uh, there is, as a result, uh, chronic, very, very high unemployment, an inability of people to form and sustain families, loss of income, 
And then this happens, and this is kind of a perverse sort of unanticipated effect of the benefits of the civil rights movement is the increasing uh, mobility, upward mobility of African Americans and uh, some loosening of restrictions on where you could live which enabled uh, more successful people to be able to move out of the inner cities that were being subjected to the massive deindustrialization and unemployment, leaving isolated uh, a large number of people who, whose isolation was really quite severe in terms of um, um, access to academic English and access to social networks that would lead to upward mobility. And I don't mean to say for a moment that these, you know, people, we talk about under-resourced communities. Uh, plenty of resources, psychological, familial, uh, and, and social resources in the communities we're describing that we uh, often overlook. But in terms of preparation for schooling, for school success, these kids were severely disadvantaged, and that was one of Wilson's points. And schools also declined. So the motor behind this, I think we can say, even though Wilson has been challenged, but I think the argument has basically stood the test of time, that very profound changes in the economic and social structure of the society that lay outside schools were driving conditions that stopped the progress that we saw being made. Now, here's the question. Is it true, then, that the only way you could overcome this problem would be to reverse those economic and social conditions, which I certainly would love to see reversed, but the question is, do we have to wait until that happens, or can we do something in schooling that would dramatically reduce racial inequality? So, so the kind of the argument is, even though if schooling wasn't the main cause, it still could be the main way, or one of the main, a very powerful way in which we overcome inequality. And, and that's what I would argue. Um, I, I forgot to mention an article that Rob Sampson and Pat Sharkey and I published in 2008, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, where we I think we have some pretty strong evidence that living in a severely uh, disadvantaged neighborhood in Chicago uh, reduces the verbal skills of, uh, in terms of academic English. Not necessarily all across the board, but in terms of academic English, reduces the skills of kids. It's another piece of evidence in favor of Wilson's argument. So, but my question really is, despite the fact that powerful social forces are sustaining inequality, and stopping the convergence, what role can schools play? And I'm saying they can play a big role. And I think we have plenty of evidence, and that's what I want to emphasize to support that. So here are my claims. The first is that increasing the quantity of schooling can reduce inequality, just the sheer quantity. And, and that's because, uh, because academic instruction that kids receive at home is vastly unequal because parents have vastly unequal amounts of education. Schools are unequal, but believe it or not, as unequal as they are, they're not as unequal as homes are. So kids actually benefit from school, and the kids who benefit most are the kids who, need, who don't get academic instruction at school. And so the argument is increasing the quantity of schooling will reduce racial inequality because poor kids, minority kids, benefit dramatically from schooling. Um, Secondly, that increasing uh, the qu and equalizing school quality will dr can dramatically reduce racial inequality. And then there's a but. The third one is, but big increases in quality will require, I think, major changes in instruction and school organization. Our schools are not well organized to, for, for instructional improvement. And that's one of my major points. And a lot of that stuff I've learned while I've been in the last four years, while I've been here in Chicago, looking at people on the south side who've been trying to create terrific schools and seeing what they confront. 